tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. <laughs> Good evening. I'm storyteller Otis Gyre, and I ain't your grandfather. From where I'm from, we don't do bedtime stories. And if that's what you were expecting, you're in the wrong place. If it's terrifying tales you're after, well then, I've got just the thing. Get comfortable, settle in. Turn off the lights, if you dare. Your night is about to get a whole lot darker. <laughs> Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> Good evening, you're listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Welcome to Season 6, Episode 14. I'm your host, Otis Jiry. In tonight's episode, I'll be performing four spine-chilling tales for you about cryptic confessions, bedtime terrors, eerie illnesses, and unbelievable effigies. You're listening to the standard edition of tonight's program, which contains the first two terrifying tales. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy an extended version of this and other episodes with twice the tear, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. Thank you for your support. Now it's time to take a walk together down the moonlit trail. So lock your doors, turn your lights down low. Settle in. The show is about to begin. <laughs> Our first tale tonight comes to us from author Kevin David Anderson and takes us to a small town with big secrets. Without further ado, I present to you Scarecrows and Devils. I know where them bodies are, said the boy. Sheriff Burke eyed the skinny 15-year-old sitting in one of two wooden chairs on the other side of his desk. He knew the kid, knew him well enough to notice he was wearing his Sunday best, loose-fitting hand-me-downs that hung like clothes on a scarecrow. But still, in these parts anyway, dapper enough for God. Burke reached for his cup of hot coffee. And what bodies are those, Seth? The boy pulled a Bible from under his arm and set it on the desk. The one Jew and Deputy Wayne been looking for. Seth took a quick look around. Where's Deputy? Anyhow. Burke followed the boy's gaze around the tiny police station. It was a place anyone could take in at a glance. Two small desks in a small dispatch area, decked out in equipment circa 1967, made up the brunt of the station's innards. Toward the rear of the one-room station was a long window, hidden beneath worn drapes the color of dried blood and two iron-barred holding cells. An orange discoloration peppered the bars and locks. Locks so old, Burke wasn't even sure if they worked. Not that it mattered much in a quiet, mostly forgotten place like thankful Alabama. I usually hold down the Ford Solo on Sundays, catch up on paperwork and all. Now, go on, Bark said, sitting back, his chair creaking under the strain. What bodies are you talking about? The boy glanced down at his hand and said, Evans Parker and that teacher, Miss Conroy. Burke leaned forward a bit, caressing his cup. I don't know what you've heard, Seth, but them are just missing persons. The boy looked up at Burke. Don't play games, Sheriff. 
What I'm talking about is just between you and me. Seth slapped his hand on the Bible. God. Burke did his best to show no reaction, but he looked at the thick book. The Holy Doctrine looked older than he and the boy put together. Flecks of aged paper splintered off as Seth pressed down on its cracked leather cover. The boy slid his hands off the Bible and into his lap. You don't call the state police or them government folks for no missing persons. If God is my shepherd, I know you don't. Burke rotated the handle on his cup around to his other hand. Steam gently rose above the rim. If you got something to get off your chest, get out with it. The boy leaned in. Burke thought the kid's eyes had suddenly turned the color of night beetles, the kind that swarmed around the porch light in the summer. There was blood, wasn't there? Seth said. All over Evan Parker's garage and Miss Conray's kitchen. A grin played on his mouth. But you didn't find no bodies, did you? In a place like Thankful, it was harder than Chinese arithmetic to keep any kind of secret, let alone one like what he and Wayne were trying to keep regarding the crime scenes. He'd kept a tight lip, but wasn't sure about Wayne. The sheriff had bumped into his deputy more than once at Miller's Tavern, impressing the liquored-up locals with some embellished tale of life on the beat. The fact about the blood at both scenes, in pools on the floor and in Jackson Pollock's splatters on the wall, it would have made one terrific barroom story. Be a miracle if Wayne had managed to keep his mouth shut. Burke lowered his cup onto the desk like a dragonfly, touching down on Cahaba Lily. You want to tell me how you know about that? Because I know who killed them. Was it you, Seth? Seth smiled and looked down at his hands again. No, Sheriff, it weren't me. Well, son, you have my attention. It was my cousin Haley. Burke sighed. Seth, I know how close you and your cousin were. I'm sure her death hit you pretty hard, and when we find the son of a bitch that run her down like a dog in the street, I personally hold that bastard so you and your kin can get some justice. But till that day comes, Seth, you gotta get on. The boy sniffled, but his eyes remained dry. I loved her like a sister. If it weren't blood, we might have... Well, I don't know. Seth looked up, his eyes glassy. Fact is, I always knew she was special. Just didn't know how much till she called me one night. What night? The night that teacher, Miss Conroy, disappeared. Burke sat back deep into his chair and folded his arms across his chest. See, she was in an awful panic, Seth said. Needed my help real bad, but wouldn't say what for. She told me to come over to Miss Conroy's. Go round back, she says. Don't let anybody see you. So I does as she say. What happened, Seth? Well, I goes around, and she's at the back door holding open the screen. In the moonlight, I, I could see her hands were covered with something dark and dripping. Her overalls and cheeks were smeared with it, too. I wasn't but two steps up that porch before I could smell the blood. Awful powerful. The boy paused, and Burke wondered if it was for effect or whether he was actually reliving the moment. Seth, why was Haley covered in blood? Why do you think? Seth dipped his head forward. A strand of greasy black hair fell across his forehead, making his face look more sinister than his age normally allowed. Because she had just slit that sow from chin to birthing hole, that's why. I walked into that kitchen and got sick of myself. Oh, I swear to God, if I hadn't slipped on a heap of gizzards, I surely would have. The fall under my ass left me staring up at Haley and that big knife she was caressing like it was the baby Jesus. That sight kind of helped me focus, and I forgot all about being nauseous. Merck studied the young man. Seth brushed the strand of hair back. I think right then I was going to scream, or maybe I did. Don't know for sure. 
but she shushed me and said, I need to show you something. I sat there in a pile of that teacher's insides and watched Haley walk over to the body. It was face to the floor, and she stepped over it, then hunkered down on the big dead woman's back. She reached forward, pulled her head up by the hair, and run the blade hard across the forehead, fast-like. Then she yanked that teacher's scalp clean off. I remember saying, What the hell, Haley? Or some such thing. She just shook her head and pointed with a knife down at the woman's skull. You see him? She said. I didn't at first, but then I did. See what? Burke said. Horns, Seth answered. Tiny little horns, but an inch high, maybe two, coming right out of her skull. They must have been sticking out through the top of her head, but with all that hair, who who would know? Haley let the head fall and hit the wooden floorboard with a smack that sent blood into my eyes. By the time I wiped it away, Haley had yanked the woman's pants down, showing me the teacher's backside. She'd cut the undergarment down the middle and encouraged me to come closer. The stench was worse than the one that hit me when I walked in. Mrs. Conroy sort of let go with everything, you know. I get it, Burke nodded. Go on. Jeez, Haley, just stuck her hand in there and pushed it all aside. I know I gagged hard then. When I come up, Haley was pulling something out. It was attached just above the woman's bottom, about a roll of quarters thick and nearly two foot long. What was it? A tail. I swear on my grandmother's grave, it was a tail. Must have been tucked down deep, hidden in her backside. Burke smirked, and a slight chuckle escaped his lips. Seth held up his right hand like a Boy Scout. God is my witness, I swear, Sheriff. It was a tail. The tip was shaped like a big Indian arrowhead. Seth brought his hand down, leaned forward, and lowered his voice. Conroy, that teacher. She'd been schooling third graders for almost 20 years, and nobody knew except my cousin. Nobody ever suspected that she were a devil, a real, from the depths of hell, devil. Seth sat back, closed his thin lips firmly, and to Burke they looked like someone had laid a nightcrawler across the boy's face, both ends wiggling up the sides of his cheeks. A devil. Burke shook his head. Son, had you gone crazy? No, sir, but there are times I wish I had. You see, Haley told me the whole thing right there in that kitchen. She'd turned into a slaughterhouse. There are devils all around us, sent up from hell, not doing anything wrong, just waiting. For what, Seth? Waiting for what? Seth's eyes narrowed. The final battle. The one between God and the serpent. Well, sending up its soldiers in preparation, getting them in position for the war, last war. Burke shook his head. Seth. Haley had the sight, gift from God. She could see him. She says it were like having x-ray vision, and she knew what God needed her to do. The sheriff took a deep breath. So if she got this gift from God, what did she need you for? Seth smiled. Well, you remember how big that Conrad woman was. Near 300 pounds, she announced. Haley couldn't move her by herself. Now that Evan Parker's fellow, hell, he was only 140, soaking wet. And she said she took care of him, no problem. But Miss Conroy? Well, she hadn't thinked ahead. So you he helped her move the body. Sure enough, like I said, Sheriff, I loved her like a sister. And I love God, too. So when you think on it, what choice did I have? Burke's brow furrowed. You had a dozen choices, you little shit. Call me for one. Where'd you move the body? Seth hung his head. It was a shame on the kid's face, or simply the expression one wears when remembering how messy moving around a gutted 300-pound corpse could be. You know where Thankful Church Road bends out by Jim Halsey's place? Yeah. Ever since Mrs. Halsey died... God rest her soul. Jim sort of let her big old garden overgrow. It's just weeds now. 
But the scarecrow they made, some ten years ago still there, we buried all that we could carry of Miss Conroy under that scarecrow. It's where Haley also hid Parker's body. I think more are buried there because of all the piles of upturned earth, but I never asked her about it. Seth turned his face as if he didn't want the sheriff to look at it anymore. I didn't really get the chance to ask her, not really. She were run down two days later. Seth, you better not be horsing around here. If what you're saying is true, you're in a world of trouble, son. Seth wiped away a tear. How do you figure, Sheriff? Well, for starters, how about two counts of aiding and abetting after the fact and one count of accessory to murder? Sheriff, you ain't been listening. There were no murders. There's devils. Killing devils is God work. Ain't no murder about it, no sir. Seth, I hope to God that on some level you know how much horseshit you spewing. Damn, son. Ain't no devils in the thankful. The boy's eyes, glassy but focused, met Burke's. I need you to believe me, Sheriff. Hell, I believe you believe it. Burke sat his still full cup on the desk. Now, let's you and me take a little ride out to the Halsey place. I don't think you understand, Sheriff Burke. Seth jumped up and put a hand on the Bible. I didn't come here to make a confession. Burke got to his feet, but not as fast as the boy, but steady and watchful. Seth flipped over the leather cover, reached in and pulled back something black and metallic out of the hollowed-out pages. The kid aimed the old revolver at Burke's chest. He came here to kill me a devil. Burke looked back and forth from the Bible's pages, hollowed out in the shape of a gun to the black short barrel pointed at his chest. It was a small revolver, the kind most hunters carried for that final shot, when the one that brought the animal down had failed to kill. Oh, Christ, son, what the... You see, when Haley died, they were passed to me, the gift. I got the sight now, and I can see those horns under your scalp. Seth pointed to Burke's head with the revolver, then slowly down to his groin. Burke's mouth went dry, and his testicles retracted. Your tail ain't as long as that, Miss Conworth, but I can seize it all the same. You're trying to hide it by wrapping it around your thigh, but it won't work against someone who's got the sight. Seth, you crazy. I don't have a tail. Jesus H. Christ. Burke still had his hand near his cup, and he slowly looped two fingers inside the handle. I'll drop my pants right now and show you if you want. Just don't do anything stupid. Sorry, Sheriff, I know my duty. And you're one devil that won't be around for the final battle. Seth pulled the hammer back and made a rusty click. Now hold on. As quick as a gator snatches a meal from the water's edge, Burke scooped up the coffee mug and thrust the scalding hot liquid into Seth's face. The boy screamed, tottered. Burke was quick. He leaned over the desk and clamped his beefy hand around the back of Seth's neck and slammed his face into the desk. Blood inked the desk blotter. He let the boy's unconscious body fall back into the chair. Crazy son of a bitch, Burke said, wiping his forehead. He could tell by the cracking sound when the face hit the desk that he'd broken the boy's nose, and by the way one of his cheeks sagged. Burke figured that wasn't all that was broke. He moved around to where Seth was slumped, Bending down, he picked up the boy in his arms, carried him to the back of the station. Pushing open one of the iron gates with his foot, he moved into a holding cell. With all the gentleness he could muster for a boy who just thrust a gun in his face, Burke lay Seth on a canvas cot. He returned to his desk and stared at the revolver. The trigger guard was dripping coffee, the hammer was still cocked, a haunting reminder of how close he'd come to meeting his maker. Crazy, son of a bitch. He used the pencil to lift the gun by the trigger guard. He returned the handgun to its hollowed-out spot in the Bible. Flipping the pencil round, he used the rubber end to close the book's heavy leather-bound cover. He exchanged the pencil for an old cracked ruler, and he pushed the Bible toward the edge of the desk like a man sweeping refuge out of his garage. He fell over the edge, tumbling end over end into an aluminum wastebasket, 
where I lay with a crumpled paper, a moldy banana peel, and pencil shavings. Burke shook his head. Some bitch. He walked back to the cell, stepped inside, and closed the iron doors behind him. How many of them were there? It seemed like every time he got rid of one, another took its place. And always teens. What the hell is God's preoccupation with making champions out of teenagers? It didn't matter. When the final battle comes, Burke would be there to do his part, and no child champion of God was going to have a say in it. Whether Burke had to run them down in the street like dogs or squeeze the life out of them with his bare hands, he'd do whatever it took to see the rightful Lord and Master walk the earth again. Burke knelt beside the unconscious boy. He felt his eyes turn blood red, and the horns beneath his scalp tingled with excitement. Then he placed his devil hands around the boy's throat. I hope you enjoyed Scarecrows and Devils, as written by Kevin David Anderson. If you enjoyed that last tale, I'd like to encourage you to check out more of the author via his profile on creepypastastories.com. Just visit simplyscarypodcast.com slash kevinhorror, all one word, and you'll find yourself on a page with links to not just his website, but his social media and his books on Amazon. Or visit kevindavidanderson.com, that's Anderson with an S-O-N at the end, to go there directly. So what are you waiting for? Pick up a copy of his collections of tales or his latest novels and novellas. You won't be sorry you did. There's plenty more where tonight's chilling tales came from just waiting for you to dive in. Up next, we've got another second tale of terror for you, courtesy of author Byron Dunbar, and it was submitted directly to me for our consideration. I am honored that mine is the first audio horror program to feature Byron's sinister story. In it, we'll meet a boy with some unsettling fears of the monsters he believes are stalking him. But everyone knows monsters aren't real, right? (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Without further ado, I present to you Uncle Scratch. Daddy, why is Mommy so cold? She was dead. Maurice knew that much, but why was she so cold? His father, a stout man named Gregory, was silent. Everyone knows we die. Not even children deny it. Yet knowing a fact and believing it are different. Maurice knew his mother lay dead in her casket. Gregory explained the custom of a wake to him in advance. Yet while Maurice was old enough to acknowledge death, he was too young to believe his mother could die. They didn't speak on the drive home. As they passed between houses, Maurice thought the vacant windows resembled his mother's empty eyes. Maurice hardly breathed, and his father dared not look at him. They moved not long after. That was when Maurice began seeing monsters. Gregory made his living as an event coordinator. He originally focused on local events, mainly weddings. After his wife's death, he began coordinating large-scale festivals and trade shows. This required him to travel across the country, Often he would rent a new house, but never spent enough time there to settle down. As a result, Maurice never formed strong attachments or friendships. However, he saw plenty of monsters. Each new home contained some dark presence, be it a ghoulish face in the bedroom window, a cold spot in the basement, or creaking in the attic. Gregory insisted the claws in the moonlight were only gnarled trees, He told Maurice he saw the silhouettes of cobwebs on the staircase, not ghosts. Their humid cellar contained insects, not demons. That didn't explain the dank smell in the kitchen of their next home. Maurice thought it was a vampire. 
He warned his father that it must sleep under the sink for lack of a coffin. It bode its time till night, whispered Maurice, when it slunk out to drink the blood. Their latest home was different, though. Even though he saw its photograph, Maurice fell uneasy. The emotion almost did not exist, save for his vaguest contemplation. The fear only appeared when he arrived in person. It was sunset. Gregory stood outside the car. He admired the house from the curb before rushing indoors. Maurice studied every inch. He gazed from the gables to the garden. His eyes found an upstairs window, soon to be his bedroom. There he saw Uncle Scratch. Dimly lit from below as the sun melted behind the clouds. His form was visible in the dying light, yet his features remained hidden. Maurice's expression bore no surprise. The boy was experienced at recognizing monsters. They were all worrisome, yet Maurice knew Uncle Scratch would be the worst. Most monsters were eager to reveal their presence. Their hideous faces quickly appeared in his nightmares. That day, Maurice only saw Uncle Scratch's moss-colored eyes. Then he left the window pane and submerged into darkness. In other ways, Uncle Scratch was like any monster. He appeared at night and resided within the bedroom closet. Maurice took care to keep it spotless. Monsters are less inclined to haunt clean spaces. During the first night, Uncle Scratch's stare confronted him. His mossy eyes betrayed an insatiable hunger. Maurice knew that Uncle Scratch did not care for flesh. He wanted something more and Maurice feared it was the worst. Maurice owned a nightlight. It was a gift from his mother, and it covered him in other homes. He tried to use it here, but it was disturbing to have a nightlight illuminating Uncle Scratch. Maurice cringed at the sight of the slimy rats. Uncle Scratch's gloved hands stroked them as they writhed. His touch was never gentle. They scurried over his suit, clashing with his unwrinkled tie and spotless white gloves. This cleanliness amplified the rat's repulsiveness. Once, a rat attempted to issue a warning. He told Maurice not to accept Uncle Scratch's treats. Before it finished, Uncle Scratch pulled the rat away. He dropped it into his pocket by its tail. Maurice heard it squeal as it disappeared. Then Uncle Scratch spoke to him. His whisper was coaxing, almost friendly. He offered Maurice a treat, but he did not accept. Uncle Scratch left, promising to bring Maurice another surprise tomorrow. Maurice shuddered, for monsters never spoke. They waited until Maurice fell asleep before venturing forward. Walking chased them away. Uncle Scratch could not be frightened so easily. Every night, Maurice heard him beckon. Scratch proved strenuous for Gregory as well. Go to bed, he ordered, as they listened to the radio. But Daddy, Uncle Scratch will be up there, Maurice sobbed. He'll show me some candy or a toy. He'll try to get me. Please, Daddy. It's getting harder to resist him every night. He just won't ever give up. Your obsession with monsters is tiresome, sighed his father. It's those pulp magazines you read. If they hadn't belonged to your mother, I'd have burned the lot to ashes. Maurice listened for a moment until the ball game on the radio returned. Gregory turned away to enjoy it. Maurice hated sports. He never understood why his father fussed over them. Sighing, Maurice went upstairs for bed. As he departed, Gregory called after him. Remember to brush your teeth. After three steps, Maurice stopped. He studied the stairs. He wondered about the creaking. In an earlier house, Lady Swoon Moon made similar sounds. He remembered her long teeth. She painted them like candy canes with the blood of children. To Maurice, each creak was the sound of munching. He visualized her crouched over the bones of innocent victims. Maurice quaked in fear. He ran up the stairs and saw the bathroom door. It was a foot from his bedroom. Maurice needed to relieve himself. The bathroom always seemed miles away. 
He stepped forward and heard a creak. His bedroom door was open and a rat scurried out. Don't listen to him, Maurice, it squeaked. He told me there'd be a dollhouse. The rat never finished. The door opened wider and Uncle Scratch's hand shot forward. He clutched the rat and dragged it into the bedroom. It screamed in the voice of a young girl. The door shut and Uncle Scratch's eye materialized in the keyhole. It stared at Maurice lustfully. The boy bolted into the bathroom and slammed the door. He quivered on the toilet for hours. Eventually, his eyes shut and he fell asleep. Meanwhile, his closet door opened and Uncle Scratch crept out. Through the bathroom keyhole, he studied Maurice. His expression sparkled with anticipation. Soon. He whispered as his tongue massaged his lips. Gregory had fallen asleep listening to his radio. He awoke suddenly, and his lips parted in fear. He studied his radio vacantly, as reruns of Lights Out was playing. He switched it off, while his free hand fumbled in his pocket for matches. Quivering, he lit his pipe. Good Lord, he whispered to himself. What a nightmare. His face sunk as he remembered fragments of his dream. Gloved hands, rats, and mossy eyes. Someone he knew was screaming in that dream, someone young. Better check on Maurice, he whimpered to himself. He trod up the stairs, through the hallway, and into Maurice's room. My God! He exclaimed upon entering. He stood, staring, his hand frozen on the doorknob. Toys littered the floor, but Maurice's bed was empty. His face paled. Then he heard snoring from outside. The bathroom light was on, and he sighed with relief. He smiled as he opened the bathroom door and saw him sleeping. That's my boy. He sighed. His arms sagged with the child's weight as he lifted him. Maurice's eyes fluttered while his father carried him to his bedroom. They half opened as the blanket swished over him before closing once more. Hours later, Maurice awoke. He silently cursed his foolishness and wondered how he got into bed. In the darkness, a noise sounded, yet it was not rats scurrying or children moaning. It was a human voice. Maurice was still corpse-like. The noise broke the silence like ice cracking. Maurice drew a silent breath and listened closer. There was a silence, then a whine. A long sob emerged before the silence returned. Maurice turned his head. The moon outside had disappeared, and the room was black. Another murmur. There was no mistake. Someone was weeping. Was this Uncle Scratch? Maurice had never heard a monster cry, not even as a trick. A wet sound followed like a bucket collecting rain. Maurice visualized tears streaming down a woman's face. Another sob. It was nearer now. The dripping continued, accentuated by occasional moans. The sound was feminine. Maurice remembered his mother and his eyes watered. He debated turning on his lamp. Uncle Scratch would have offered a treat by now. He reached toward the switch but stopped. There was a fumbling, then a sob near Maurice's ear. In fact, he drew his hand back and the noise ceased. Maurice did not lie down. He feared the presence would hear his mattress. In the dark, something slithered. Maurice sensed the presence under his bed. Sweat tickled his chin, but he was too frightened to wipe it away. The voice returned. He had wept under the bed in a constant stream. Did it want his attention? Maurice ventured a question. Why are you crying? He asked. The sound ceased, and Maurice heard a soft creaking as something crawled out from under the bed. There was silence until a, a huddled mass formed over the window. Maurice... The mass whimpered. Is that you? Maurice turned pale. It sounded like his mother. Suddenly, a blue light jarred the mass into a straight stance. Maurice saw that it was indeed his mother. The light emanated from wires fastened to her skull. 
She floated before him like a specter. Maurice tilted his head and noticed Uncle Scratch illuminated in the corner. His mossy eyes stared at his mother viciously. After several jolts, she floated limply in the air. Uncle Scratch lifted a hammer and an ice pick for Maurice to see. Casually, he strode nearer while Maurice watched helplessly, floundering electric sparks from the wires occasionally tore through the darkness. In these moments, Maurice watched Uncle Scratch set the hammer down on his bedside table. Uncle Scratch pulled back his mother's left eyelid. Slowly, he inserted the ice pick over the top of her eyeball. He carefully slid it deeper until it hit bone. He retrieved his hammer, and with two taps broke through the thin layer of skull. Maurice observed Uncle Scratch scraping behind it. Another two taps and more scraping behind the other eyeball, and Uncle Scratch discarded his tools. He turned back to Maurice. That's what they did to her, Maurice. Uncle Scratch whispered. They didn't even bother to get a doctor to do it, just some staff member. Then they turned her loose and she took a tumble down the stairs. We both know how that turned out, don't we? The blue crackles died with the last of Uncle Scratch's words. Murray sat in thick darkness. He groped back in bed when he heard Uncle Scratch's sinister voice in the blackness. I can bring her back, Maurice. He said, There will be a price, but nothing worthwhile is ever free. Just say yes. The sound of rats scuttling behind the walls appeared. A mixture of fear and loneliness consumed Maurice. He wondered if Uncle Scratch could restore his mother. If so, what would we remain of her? There was hardly a sound when Maurice whispered, Yes. In a flash, the room was empty. Maurice turned on his light and checked under his bed for his mother. He found her sprawled on the floor, gibbering mindlessly. Maurice crawled under the bed and lay with her. He wept and stroked her hair. They exchanged a horrified glance. She opened her mouth to speak, but only drool dripped out. Uncle Scratch had restored her flesh, but her mind was another matter. Moments later, Uncle Scratch's hand snuck under the bed and pulled Maurice away. He locked him in the closet where he was alone with the rats. Uncle Scratch forbade him from calling to his mother and then whispered, It's time to pay the price I mentioned. When a child disappears, questioning the parents, his routine police work, the officers escorted Gregory from his home. From the car, he had one glance at the house. He looked upwards and gazed at the window to... Maurice's bedroom. Before the police car departed, he saw a rat on the windowsill. For some reason, the sight disturbed him. It was just as well that his hearing was only average. Had he keen ears, he would have heard a voice squealing. Daddy, help me, please, Daddy. I hope you enjoyed Uncle Scratch, my author, Byron Dunbar. I'd like to thank you, personally, for joining me for this episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to us. If you'd like to hear a premium extended edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes featuring twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com where you can purchase season passes for this podcast and our other quality storytelling programs. Or become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive, 
dating back to 2012, all of it ad-free. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You can subscribe to me on YouTube as well at the Otis Jiry channel, where you'll find releases of my series, Horror Storytime, dating back to 2014. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, too. Just search for Otis Jiry. Until next week, stay spooky and get some sleep if you can. <laughs> Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Otis Jiry. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering provided by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. Program's artwork and logo by David Romero. If you're looking for some fresh tales on a daily basis while waiting for the next podcast, check out my YouTube channel, The Otis Jiry Channel, and my extensive collection of narrated tales there. Simply search on YouTube by my name, and you'll find me. And don't forget to subscribe and press the bell notification icon to get my latest releases. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at otis at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. That's O-T-I-S at simplyscarypodcast.com. If you've enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Wednesday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Wednesday with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs>